Okay, next one is OCD. You experience in some kind of obsession, some kind of recurrent intrusive thought that you can't stop thinking about. Okay, it's a compulsive act that you feel compelled to perform. Okay, example here is repetitive hand washing. What are some other OCD behaviors? I'm asking you guys. Cleanliness, um, picking up paper off the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yep. Stuff like organized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. 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 So time spent in these thoughts and these rituals can become overwhelming to the point of interfering with your normal life. Another type of mental illness is PTSD, where some kind of previous event has caused you to currently have intense fear, helplessness, horror. The remembrance of this event produces feelings of distress, extreme distress, actually, along with anxiety, maybe nightmares, flashbacks. That was one of your quiz questions. Mm -hmm. And then how do you work with a client who may be suicidal or have suicidal ideations? One of the most important things is ensuring safety, right? Making mm -hmm. sure they cannot get at anything that will cause them harm. The other thing that's important with working with somebody who may be suicidal or have suicidal ideations, and this, I worked with kids in the, at the high school level, um, in the schools that, so that, that friends or teachers or somebody would come and say, you know, this student has said something. So in talking with that student, here are some questions I had to ask. Do you have a plan? What is your plan? Do you have the methods to carry out your plan? Have you attempted suicide prior? You have to be able to ask um, very pointed questions if they are indeed experiencing suicidal ideations. Okay. Um, we know that children, I have this highlighted for you here, children are at the highest risk for mental disorders. Okay. That is secondary to adverse circumstances. And this produces an ongoing disruption to their lives. Okay. One of the uh, medications that's often prescribed, and this is true, this is for bipolar, lithium. is lithium. Okay, if you're working with somebody who's been recently diagnosed with bipolar and they've been prescribed lithium, lithium's a pretty potent mental health drug. We have to be able to do some teaching with the families. Okay, so here's the few important teaching points. Highlighted them. Important teaching points, encouraging normal salt intake and report diarrhea, vomiting, tremors, or lack of coordination. So that is the one medication I want you to be familiar with. Okay. Last concept for week four was alcohol, tobacco, and other drug problems. We know that substance abuse contributes to lots of things. In particular, teen pregnancy, HIV, STDs, domestic violence or violence in general, child abuse, motor vehicle accidents, fights, crime, homicide, suicide. And that's just for starters, right? We know that some people are predisposed to maybe predisposed to alcoholism, predisposed genetically, predisposed to drug abuse as they are with heart disease or cancers. Okay.
some terms and definitions to be familiar with. Substance, what are the differences between substance abuse, drug dependence, drug addiction, alcoholism, polysubstance abuse? I want you to read through those, okay? Just be able to identify from a scenario. Is this scenario somebody with alcoholism, somebody with a drug addiction, somebody with drug dependence? Okay, so you can read through that section because I want to go through some specifics. Nicotine, tobacco. Okay. It's the, it's the drug that is most addictive. Okay. We know that nicotine abuse can, uh, contributes to cancer, heart disease, emphysema, bronchitis, chronic airway obstruction. It also contributes to uh, low birth weight babies, right? Premature births. We know that secondhand smoke is an issue as well, contains more carcinogens and toxins than the first stream smoke. What are the dangers of vaping and e-cigarettes? What if a parent said, what if you're working with a family that it's a smoking home and there's kids with asthma in the house and you're working with the family towards a goal of a smoke-free home? What if the parent says, yeah, don't worry, I, I vape now, I'm okay, that's all right. Is that okay? No. No, what's the dangers? What are the dangers of vaping and e-cigarettes, so, especially with kids in the house? The that can is stronger oh. because it, there is no heat to dissolve the, uh, to break it down. What so, is it, Charmaine, say that again? I said the nicotine, when you vape, the nicotine is okay. stronger mm -hmm. okay. because opposed to smoking, because when you smoke, the heat, the fire breaks mm -hmm. down some of the nicotine. But when you vape, there is no heat okay. to break it down. So the nicotine is, is stronger. Okay. That's part of it. Laura, were you going to contribute? Yeah, I was saying popcorn lung. You can get popcorn lung and all kinds of other lung diseases from having that mm -hmm. beehive lungs, just popcorn okay. lung. That's another part of it. I'm looking for something specific. That About it being absorbed in the bloodstream. Okay. Keep going. What about it's the addictive. oil? What about the oils? And vaping and e-cigarettes. Poisoning? Yes. These oils that are in these products are poisonous to kids. Okay, so if a parent says, no, I started vaping, I'm not smoking, I'm not vaping, that's actually somewhat worse because of the poisonous oil that the kids may be exposed to. Right? Alcohol abuse, billions and billions of dollars of lost productivity, property damage, medical expenses from alcohol-related in injuries, accidents, family disruptions, divorce, violence, alcohol-related violence, neglect, abuse, right? Chronic alcohol abuse has multiple effects on our, on our body. And then it goes through what the liver and pancreas or what the liver can metabolize. Okay, so that was one of your quiz questions. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. So here's blood alcohol concentration, BAC, determined by several things. You're going to get asked about this on the next exam. So be aware of this. Okay, blood alcohol concentration is determined by the concentration of what you drink, the rate of drinking, the rate of absorption, the rate of metabolism, and a person's weight in sex. Okay, so so if, if, if the important point to remember here is a lot of a lot of students think that blood alcohol concentration is measured only by how much you drink. 
And that's not the case. There's several factors that are going to impact what your blood alcohol concentration is. Okay. One of the other things also that's important is if you're working with um, somebody who is withdrawing from alcohol. Let's say you're working in a facility and somebody is you were in a detox, part of a detox program. Let's say they're experiencing the delirium tremor, tremens. What are we going to prioritize? Safety, right? Safety. If they're already experiencing delirium tremens, we want to use seizure precautions, right? What are seizure precautions? Side rails. Mm -hmm. They have an IV in. They have O2 at the bedside. They need it. Suction's available if they need it. If they're already experiencing symptoms of in their withdrawal phase, you have to be prepared and think about safety at all times. Okay. Cocaine. There's a different, not a whole, it's quite similar, but it, it's different. But you need to know about um, what, say you're presented with somebody that may be high on cocaine or maybe cocaine overdose. What does that look like? What might they present with? Mm -hmm. Okay, signs of cocaine use, dilated pupils, high levels of energy and activity excited, exert, exurban, ex exuberant speech. Okay. And then it goes through withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so be aware of that as well. Signs of it and withdrawals. Same with amphetamines and methamphetamines. Okay. We know with amphetamines and methamphetamines, they can be taken as pills, injected, snorted, smoked, IV, intravenously. Okay. An elevation in mood, increased wakefulness, alertness, concentration, intensified physical performance. Okay. So again, know what somebody coming to you might be presented, presenting with, okay? We know that methamphetamines create, they create immediate high, but that high fades quickly. Mm -hmm. That way, this because of this, they may take the substance more frequently, which can lead to addiction. And then I want you to go through some examples with regards to alcohol, drug, and alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs of primary prevention. Well, let's talk about it. Harm reduction, most important thing, harm reduction. It's a primary response to substance abuse, right? You're trying to focus on disease prevention. Right, so if you're looking at primary interventions for alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, right, you're trying to promote healthy lifestyles, you're trying to increase resiliency, maybe you're educating about drugs and addiction to drugs, making better choices, having better groups of friends, other options beside relying on drugs. Okay, here are some other examples in here that you can read through. Secondary, how do, I, how do we identify people at risk for substance abuse? And when we do, how do we teach them appropriate interventions? Maybe they've already started dabbling with drugs or alcohol. 
right? If we've identified them at high risk, can we help teach them about the connection between using drugs and long-term effects or even short-term effects? What kinds of negative consequences they're gonna have for themselves, their families, their job, Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to cover with that. Does anybody have any questions about that? Here, here's um, setting up. You no, know, setting up community-based activities aimed at substance abuse prevention. This is a, this is a good list of things that are commonly done in communities. So I just want you to have a look at this. Okay, nothing to memorize, but just to give you some ideas of what communities do with regards to substance abuse prevention. And then lastly, some to reiterate some of the high risk groups, right? Some of the high risk groups with the likelihood of adverse health outcomes and have a high risk of addiction. Adolescents, they experiment, right? That's part of their natural development. Alcohol, marijuana, opiate. Maybe they have family issues, family problems. Maybe they're being abused. Okay, older adults we know are another high risk group, high rates of alcoholism. And sometimes alcoholism can be related to, or it can be confused with cognitive changes. Right? Pregnant women, another high risk, another high risk group. Fear of losing their children, other children, stigmatization, risk of fetal alcohol syndrome. For the pregnant women, low birth weight, premature birth, birth defects, maybe um, addicted babies when they're born. And then the other high risk group is the injection drug users, high risk for overdose, high risk for using contaminated needles. Okay. Question about any any of the week four content. Lots of high risk individuals with regards to special vulnerable populations, mental illness, alcohol, tobacco, and other drug issues. So let's shift our attention to week five, which is hospice, palliative care, death and dying, faith and spirituality, and ethics. Okay, if you look at your readings for this week, chapter three has a couple of pages. This is all in your fundamentals. Chapter 15, 14 is the full chapter. Okay. And chapter 15 is uh, 10, 12 pages. Okay. And then in, embedded in your module for week five are a couple of pages of readings, one on hos, hos, one, hospice and palliative care. So make sure you take a look at those. Okay. So let's talk about hospice and palliative care, death and dying, All right? So we know that in hospice care, the nurse is focusing on keeping, focusing on the needs of the client. Okay, we know the family's involved as well. And they're part of our group of clients, but the primary responsibility is the client, keeping them comfortable, trying to maintain their dignity and self-esteem, right? We know that one of the important points in hospice care is trying to control the pain, make them as comfortable as possible, 
However, we don't want to keep the client so sedated they're unaware of what's even happening, right? We want the client to still be able to interact with their family. And if possible, participate in care decisions, right? We know the family needs are important, but the client needs are most important. Right, so in hospice and palliative care, the goal is to alleviate suffering as much as possible without attempting to cure, right? We're trying to improve the quality of life not the quantity, right? Because if we're in hospice care, whatever the, whatever the condition or diagnosis is, it's not curable, right? All aggressive treatments have been stopped, right? We need to work with the client and family if necessary into helping them accept that death is a normal and expected experience. All right, like I said, aggressive treatments have stopped. The goal becomes focused on quality rather than quantity. All right, in addition to symptom management for our hospice patients, right, we, all, we also want to provide the patient's families with the patient and the families with whatever kind of psychological or spiritual support they need. So we need to be able to evaluate if they're seeking additional resources. One of the um, interesting facts about hospice clients, sometimes the family has a hard time understanding, is dehydration. Dehydration in the terminally ill patient has actually been shown to decrease pain. Anybody know that? Decrease pain and make the clients more comfortable, right? Rather than continuing the tube feedings into the intestine with the IV fluids where they become uncomfortable. Sometimes that's hard for families to understand. Okay, at the beginning of hospice care, we want the client to be as participatory in their plan of care. How do they want their hospice care carried out? Do they want feeding tubes? Do they want resuscitation, right? And so we try and we try and work with the the families at the beginning to identify what the goals are going to be. And once we have that in writing, especially from the client, that is our blueprint. Okay, we have to carry out what the client wants. The family may have disagreements or different thoughts about what they want, but we have to carry out the client's wishes and then work with the families in educating them. Uh, on why we're providing the care that we are, right? Um, hospice care can be provided in different locations, home, hospice facility, long-term care facility, right? We know the hospice, as we talked about, is the end stage of life, right? We're trying to alleviate as much suffering as possible, right? We're trying to improve whatever we can with this end of life experiences. Okay. Some of the things we can be doing with regards to physical support, alleviate pain, reduce air hunger, try and improve sleep, social support. And I have this highlighted for you. Facilitate relationships that may be strained or neglected that the patient wants to mend. Right? Maybe working with the client to update the will, working with the client to make sure we gather people, loved ones that they want to say goodbye to. And then spiritual support if they so choose to want spiritual support. Where do we go and find a spiritual advisor? Do they belong to a congregation of a particular religion, whatever they are? Okay. And then the other thing we have to understand in hospice nursing is the stages of grief, anger, bargaining, depression, accept, den denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. 
the client and the family may be in very different stages of the grief process, right? Each family member may be in a different stage of the grief process. So we have to have an understanding of that grief process and be able to identify which which stage different people are in that are involved with this hospice client, including the client. All right, so for example, in denial, let's say a family member of the client's in denial. What do we do? Right here, remain with the family member. Okay? Moving on, accepting. Showing acceptance of the feelings is an intervention for the acceptance stage of grief. Okay, suggesting a referral to mental health professional may be appropriate for depression. So we, we have to we have to be aware of what the stages of grief are and try and identify if families are struggling, maybe what stage they are so we can work with them. Okay, the one thing we don't want to do with hospice clients is make decisions for them. All right, so if we try and make decisions for them, that removes any autonomy and decision-making from them, right? It's ineffective to make decisions for them, okay? Therapeutic communication is also important with the hospice client. Ask open-ended questions. Don't make assumptions. Don't offer platitudes to them. You know, everybody dies at some point. Um, God will forgive you for whatever sins you have. I mean, that's not the way we communicate with hospice clients, right? And this is why if, if they want to have a spiritual advisor, these are the discussions they would have with that spiritual advisor. Again, with hospice, we need to be aware of our own beliefs, our own feelings about end-of-life care. Okay? Let's see. Pain control is possible and expected. We aren't worried about addiction. We are not worried about addiction, right? With the hospice client. Right? If for some reason, whatever has been prescribed for them is not holding them, we need to be able to pick up the phone and call the physician and let them know this and get additional additional pain measures in place for them. Okay, as death becomes imminent, we know that the client spends more time sleeping, appetite fades, oral intake falls, urine output decreases, incontinence. Vital signs, maybe the pulse goes up, blood pressure goes down. Skin extremities become mottled and cool. Respirations become shallow and irregular. Chine Stokes respirations be become more and more shallow, followed by periods of apnea. Okay, and then respirations assume. Reason. You may hear, they may sound like they have a wet, their breathing is wet. Secretions, secretions in the lungs... You almost feel like you need to suction them or want to suction them, right? Hospice care is very mentally challenging on the nurse. Has anybody had an experiences working with hospice nurses or had a family member that's gone through hospice and worked with a hospice nurse? I've had both and, and both have been pretty incredible experiences. Anybody? Had experiences? My daughter was a hospice nurse. Oh, wow. Wow. Does this sound familiar? Yes. All it of what we're talking about? <laughs> Pardon me? It didn't last very long. Oh, okay. It didn't, it didn't last very long with her. She couldn't take it. She couldn't take it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My hospice. mom was in hospice care in Treasure Coast, and it was not a very good experience. They did everything they weren't supposed to do. But yet in Georgia, when my best friend died, that was the best one. Yeah. It's hard to talk about, you know, whether you're, 
whether you're participating as a family member or you're you're a nurse working with clients really hard really hard faith and spirituality and culture all right so let's talk about cultural competence here what's cultural competence what do you think cultural competence is having a um an understanding of one's culture different cultures different being able to see every client from a different culture as unique, right? First, we've already mentioned it several times today, we have to have an understanding of our own culture, any biases or stereotypes that we hold. We must approach individuals, I can't stress this enough, as unique. Every individual from a different culture is unique. We can't make any assumptions we, about that culture. We cannot place our culture above anybody else's. Okay, we always try and consider, if we can, taking into account different cultures, practice, beliefs, uh, food preferences, visitor preferences. We always try and take as much of that culture that we can and put it into the healthcare plan. Some things we can accommodate, but most we can. All right, so their cultural wishes, preferences need to be part of that plan. Okay? So cultural competence, I have this down here. It's highlighted. Is attained. When the nurse makes a conscious attempt to learn about different cultures and looks at the world through their perspective. In our nursing profession, we are always striving towards cultural competence. I still am striving towards cultural competence and I've been a nurse for 40 years. Is the more cul different cultures you work with, the more you're still learning and I'm still learning. Right, but as I move, as I work with different, continue to work with different cultures, I must be able to try and look at the world through their perspective. Okay. We know that some cultures, jumping back up here, have, have regarding time. Some cultures are past oriented from the past. Some are present and some are future. Mm-hmm. Right? So think about it. Past-oriented cultures, they value their ancestors. And sometimes the past, they're so focused on the past and events that have occurred in the past that it's difficult for them to make future goals. Okay? Present-oriented cultures, they're focused on today, the here and the now. They're prioritizing their quality of life now. And they're making decisions that make them happy in the present. Okay, the problem or one of the challenges is this may, this may hinder their planning for the future or consider future consequences. If you're so focused on the here and the now, you're not thinking about the future. And then on the, other end, the future-oriented cultures, they're much more likely to make sacrifices today in the here and the now in order to achieve their long-term goals. So really what I want you to know is that there are different perceptions of time, past, present, future. And here's a couple of examples of specific cultural practices, Native Americans. They do not usually sustain eye contact in the same way European Americans do. They consider it rude. Okay? Jehovah's Witness. They don't oppose surgery, but they do oppose blood products, blood transfusions being given before, during, after surgery. Right? Their faith forbids them to have blood products. 
And another example, Jewish clients, they follow a kosher diet. They avoid meat from carnivores, pork products, fish without scales or fins. That's their culture. That's their food preference for their culture. So they're more likely to have fruits, vegetables, tuna, chicken, potatoes. Okay. So different cultures have different preferences. That's the whole point of cultural competence. If you, let's say you're taking care of a, a client that, or a client and a family that are from a different culture that you've never cared for, and you aren't really knowledgeable about their culture, what are you going to do? How are you going to become culturally competent to work with this client? When you like educate yourself a little more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then the other thing is ask, right? Ask. Ask the client, ask their family about cultural preferences, cultural desires, right? I'm going to skip over the faith community nurse and I'm going to talk about ethics. Okay. Ethics is involved in every part of our lives, whether it's family, school, work, community. What's ethics? Doing good, right? Making the right moral choices. Ethics, right? We are involved in ethics in all parts of our lives. So if you think about the, in this first paragraph, if you think about the nursing process, okay? Your ad pie. The first step in ethical decision-making is first you have to identify what the issue is. Maybe it's an end-of-life issue. Maybe it's a, it's a client that has a plan for end-of-life issues that or the issue is an end of life client. You have to go through the nursing process for the ethical decision making. All right. First, you have an issue, obtain the facts, consider approaches, make decisions, implement the action, evaluate the action. But my point is the first step is let's say you're teaching a program in the community. Well, you have to identify an issue that you're teaching or a topic that you're teaching. It's like ethical decision-making. First, you have to identify the ethical issues that, that's faced. Okay? Moral distress. We all experience moral distress probably daily. Okay? Whether it's in our personal lives, professional lives, school lives. Right? So moral distress is experienced when you're unable to act in accordance with with what you believe to be the right course of action. A little bit below, we'll get into an example of, an example of moral distress would be having a large load of patients. Somebody called in sick. You got a double load now. You're morally distressed about how you're gonna provide safe, effective care for 10 patients instead of five, right? So when we have any kind of moral distress, it can lead to burnout, stress, leaving the profession. Okay? It's important to face and acknowledge and recognize your feelings from moral distress. Discuss them with your teammates. Discuss them with your manager. Okay? We should definitely not ignore those feelings. Okay? Okay? Examples of moral distress, and there are many end-of-life decisions. Maybe you don't agree with what's being done. Patient load too high. Back when we were in the pandemic, COVID-19 visitor restrictions where family couldn't come in. Patients were dying alone. Not enough ventilators, potentially, when we in the middle of the pandemic. Right? Lots of reasons, lots of examples of moral distress. Okay. 
couple of ethical principles I would like you just to know what they are. One is beneficence. This is in your reading. Beneficence. Beneficence requires that we do good. Okay. An example of beneficence would be ad adequate pain control. Patients in pain, we provide medication to try and help alleviate that, alleviate that pain. That's an example of beneficence. Second one is non-malfeasance. Do no harm. Okay. An example of that would be, let's say you're cathing a patient and you contaminate the field. What do you do? You go get another kit, right? Do no harm. Another ethical principle is autonomy. It's respecting the right for the client to participate, give them autonomy, and let them participate in the decision-making in the planning of their care, if applicable. They can. And then the fourth is distributive justice. Making sure that the resources are, are allocated equally. Okay. Another important term in ethics is advocacy. We're always advocates for our kids, for our family members, for our clients. I'd be advocating for your teammates at school. Okay, you're acting in the client's best interest, your kid's best interest. Making sure they have everything they need to make informed decisions. Okay, so that could be uh, the OR nurse in pre-op, making sure that the client has all the relevant information before signing all the papers for surgery. You're advocating. Okay. A couple of legal nursing issues. Oh, well, here's your two legal issues. Documentation. We know that we can only document factual information, correct? We can't say the patient the patient appears to be sad today. Um the patient seems like they're happy today. Right? Those kind of words suggest that you're providing an opinion, right? But things that you hear, things that you see, things that you smell, those are all factual. Patient's wound was draining. Patient's leg was swollen. Um, patient urinated 100 cc's per hour. Um, IV site looks red and is draining, right? Factual information. But all the, uh, all the, the subjective stuff. Patient seems to be angry this morning. Well, okay, maybe they yelled at you because you came in and woke them up too early, but maybe you don't know that they didn't sleep all night. Right? And then another legal issue is floating. Who's all been floated to other units, right? Let's say you're floated. You know, you can't refuse to be floated, but let's say you're floated to another unit. Okay. And let's say you've never cared for a pediatric patient, but you still are floated to that unit. What can you do? What can you do safely? What tasks that can you do safely that's not going to compromise care? That's the discussion you would potentially have with that manager, whoever the leader is going to be on the floor. No, I've never done pediatric vital signs, so I don't feel comfortable safely doing that. But I can discharge a patient. I can change the beds. I can give out the lunch trays. I can whatever you can do safely. Okay. Does that make sense? So those are just some examples of some, some potential legal issues that could come up. All right. Does that help?
kind of give you an overview of ethics and legal issues. Big, big topic, big topic, ethics and legal issues. Okay. So let's see, I don't have Debbie on on camera, Christine on camera, Josephine on camera, everybody's off camera. Okay, I can only see a couple of people when I share oh, my sorry, screen. I'm sorry, I was taking notes on my good notes. Oh, and that's okay. I, through the lecture. I didn't know you can't see me. That's okay. Well, when I share my screen, I can only see like three students. I usually come back and double check, but I didn't. So um, so we cover a lot today. We cover a lot of concepts today, week four and week five. And then next week, we'll cover week six and we'll be done for exam two. Okay. Um and in maintaining, I'm six minutes over, so I apologize. I'm trying to give you get get you guys done ten minutes early because we don't take a break. I have a cahoots for week four and five, so I'm going to send that in the announcement when I send the recording for this lecture. Okay, I'll send the cahoots, and you can do that on your own time. Can you Does also? Anybody... Oh, sorry. Can you also send an example of the Hesse prep assignment so we kind of know how to do it? Well, I, I can't send an example of, let me, okay, for all of you that want to stay on and listen to two minutes of HESI prep, fine. For all of you that want to go, that's fine too. I hope you guys have a good rest of your week if you want to go. Let me bring up the HESI prep. I'm going to ask about week five. Do we have anything, any homework? I didn't see anything, but the video. All we have for week five, oops, all we have for week five is the quiz. Okay. Right. right. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Let me just review the Hesse prep here real quick. Okay. So, as I said in week one, all these boxes represent a question on the Hesse from the last time I looked at the Hesse. Okay. So this is what, these are the questions. I don't know the questions being asked, but I know the topics being asked. They're going to ask a question, something about red triage, something about disaster communication, something about natural disaster preparedness. I don't know what the questions are, but they do address it. So all these boxes are examples of questions asked. This is, I have tried to separate out this HESI prep assignment into concepts that we're going to be covering over the term, such as bioterrorism, which we don't get to until like week eight, epidemiology, week eight, health promotion and teaching, we have covered. Now, when you look at all these particular boxes under health promotion and teaching, we have covered some of them. It's part of my overall concept teaching, but the, these boxes are more specific. So you're going to have to do your own research on a lot of this. Okay. Lead poisoning. That those are in that's in your notes from common childhood ailments. Eczema is in your notes. Now it says with school sports. So they they were particularly asking a question about something about what does school sports have to do with eczema? You're going to have to do more research. Okay, but you should be able to go, be able to go to your three books and the concepts we're covering and gather this information. All right, so yes, I'm covering the concept, but I'm not covering every particular box in this assignment. It's up to you to go back. Scoliosis screening, we covered that in your common childhood ailments. Seatbelt safety, we covered that, right? So it's not... It's not that we're covering the general concept, but I can't cover every particular box. It's up to you to go back and research. So think about community risk findings. What are the risks in the community? That's we. This is you're building your own study guide. This is going to be end up being your HESI study guide. So if you wait till week eight to do it, it's going to be a long, tedious assignment. If you're working on it every couple of weeks or after class and filling in the concepts we covered, you're going to be in a lot better shape. Okay. It is, this HESI is very med surge focused. I said that in week one, heavily med surge focused. Okay. Look so at in, in home, hang on, 
in home health, look at all the med surge in here. Below the knee, COP, below the knee amputation, COPD, cirrhosis, post arthroplasty, cabbage. Okay, so you need to be thinking when I say think about the nursing process, right? It's going to require critical thinking skills about each of the topics. Right. How do you apply the nursing process from assessment to evaluation? So assume you're seeing a client, you're in the field, you're seeing a client, let's say anthrax incubation. I, I don't know, in nursing guidelines, what I probably want to put in there is maybe what are the signs and symptoms of anthrax exposure? What's the incubation period? How's it treated? Right? Level one, two, three disasters. I'd probably know, want to know what the definition of a level one, a level two, and a level three is. What's important for disaster planning? Again, you're, you're going to get out of this assignment what you put into it. If you don't spend a lot of time on it, you're not going to have a comprehensive study guide. If you do spend some time on it, and fill it out. What what do you want to know about each topic? Can you think of a question of what they're going to ask about? You know, they're going to ask about scoliosis screening. What are they going to ask? Are they going to ask, how do you position the kid? What do you look for? Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you've, you've got your boxes of information to fill out. As you're filling them out, be thinking, hmm. What are they going to ask? What are they going to ask about lipid screening? I don't know. When do you do lipid screening? What's high? What's low? I don't know. But there is a question about lipid screening. What kind of conditions do you associate doing a lipid screening for? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. And that's how I do my HESI review at the end of the term in week 10 is that we just go through your HESI reviews. And we all help each other of what, it, you know, Mina, what do you have in yours? Charmaine, what do you have in yours? You know, helping each other out. So, Lara, does it, Laura, does that help? Or anybody have any feedback? Is that yes, helpful? Yes, ma'am, that helps. That's, that was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. I do have a question. So, the HESI uh, practice thing, is that going to be, is that like on our announcements? Or modules. What now? It's the thing you just went through. Is that going to be under our announcements? You got that in week one. No, no. I'm okay. sorry. Right. It's in. It's it's due. I went through this in week one. It's due in week nine, so it would be in your week nine module. Okay. If you haven't All pulled right. that out yet. If you haven't pulled that out yet, Christine, and saved it to okay. your desktop, you really need to. Okay. And start working on it. All right. So when we Thank you. That when we submit the HESI thing, it's going to just be like a bunch of pages, right? Yeah, just save it to your desktop. I have it in a okay. Word document formula, so you could be filling it out as you go. Yeah, I started, but I write big because I printed it out, but I'm like, I ain't going to be able to write on this paper. Can't you Can't you write on it in your, as a Word document? Yeah. Yeah. And if you okay. have a lot of information on each of the boxes, just lower the font. Okay. But, but it should expand as you go, right? Like I just have a short box for each one. Once you get out of that, finish that box, doesn't it expand down? Should. Yeah, it should. It's I, a word I just, document. Every time you send something, I just print it because it's like, I don't want to miss nothing. I may yeah. not go back on it on the computer, but if I have it in my hand, okay. I can see it. Mm -hmm. All right. 